Okay. Sure. Huh? You sure? Yep. Okay. I, you, you, I'm allowed to call you? <laughs> you may call me whatever you choose. <laughs> Very good. Do we is an extra charge for the third degree or <laughs> Does that make it hard for you? No, heavens no. Probably turn it off. No, heavens no. Down? Okay. Audible? Yes. That may not necessarily be good, but uh, I'll let you decide. It's a really a very special privilege for me and honor to participate in this celebration of the remarkable life and accomplishments of William J. Casey, a talented patriot whom I had the pleasure and challenge of serving, serving with in two very important periods in our respective lives. It's particularly fitting that any commemoration of this rewarding career should pay particular attention to his relatively brief but enormously formative time with the Office of Strategic Services under the leadership of another gifted and charismatic leader, Bill Donovan, General William J. Donovan. <clears throat> Their lives were closely in linked in a fateful war which deeply affected both men and established a bond which was severed only by the death of General Donovan. Is that? Okay. It's threatening me. Okay, audible, in the back, heads are nodding, maybe not. It is for this reason that some understanding of how the Office of Strategic Services came into being and how General Donovan came to lead it so gloriously is essential to understanding its impact on the life and achievements of his distinguished namesake. As the clouds of war gathered over Europe, President Roosevelt early on recognized that the information he was getting from govern other governmental institutions, especially the State Department, <clears throat> pause, <laughs> and then the War Department was vague, poorly written, and often contradictory, leading him to fall back upon trusted friends and acquaintances to act as his eyes and ears to provide him with accurate and timely, well-informed insights into what was really taking place across the oceans. His Secretary of the Navy, Frank Knox, urged FDR to enlist the services of a fellow New Yorker and successful lawyer, William J. Donovan, into his roster of informal collectors of intelligence. It's hard to believe that FDR was not at least familiar with this name, for they had been classmates at Columbia Law School, although doubtless had moved in very different social circles. Yet Donovan was also widely known in his own right as a true American war hero, having won not only the Congressional Medal of Honor for his service with the New York Fighting Irish 69th Regiment in France, but also the Distinguished Service Cross, the Distinguished Service Medal, and three Purple Hearts as well. In addition to rising to lead the regiment in its triumphal march down Fifth Avenue, Donovan had become a highly successful lawyer and had risen quickly <clears throat> excuse me, in Republican politics in New York State. Now, I would pause here for a moment and if we recognize the contribution that Donovan made with all the medals. There was another hero of the same vintage who did not receive the medals and the recognition because his victory was a victory in a different kind of war, a cold war, if you will, but no less vicious and no less threatening to our freedoms. <clears throat> That other hero, certainly on an equal par with Bill Donovan, was Bill Casey. It was only logical, therefore, that prior to Pearl Harbor, FDR had sent Donovan on two long trips to Europe 
Europe and the Balkans receiving lengthy but very informative reports on the latter's return, particularly his conviction that Great Britain would not surrender, a finding which was in stark contrast to the reporting from, the Lon from London of U.S. Ambassador Joseph Kennedy. In addition to lengthy trip reports, Donovan urged FDR to establish some form of a centralized intelligence apparatus, not only to consolidate the growing flood of reporting from governmental agencies, but also to address the need to perform a host of paramilitary functions, which the U.S. government was simply not equipped to handle. And in addition to the importuning from Donovan and his coterie of informal roving ambassadors, Donovan's urgings were strongly supported by the U.K., and especially by Winston Churchill, who could be very persuasive when he chose to do so. And the, and the War Cabinet as well, which understood that the Second World War would be won only with American involvement, and the sooner the better. In the face of bitter domestic resistance, and remember FDR was facing a, an election, third term election, Bitter resistance, especially from the FBI, but also from the military, Roosevelt nonetheless accepted Donovan's forceful arguments and on 12 July 1941 issued an executive order establishing the coordinator of information with Donovan as its head. After Pearl Harbor, FDR went one step further and expanded the role of the coordinator of information into the Office of Strategic Services on 13 June 1942 again with General Donovan at its head. He'd been a colonel, but uh, fortunately became a brigadier and then ultimately a major general. Among the many elements of this new organization, which to some extent mirrored the British Special Operations Executive, that was the organization created by Churchill, as he said, to set Europe ablaze, and it did so. There were branches, the two key branches were Special Operations, SO, and Special Intelligence, or Secret Intelligence, SI. They were the largest ones, and then there was a third major element, which was research and analysis, the exploitation of the information produced by the other two. Their respective roles were unconventional warfare, espionage, traditional espionage, if there is such a thing, it's a wonderful contradiction in terms, and evaluation and characterization distribution of the as finished intelligence. There was one other branch which I might mention in passing, a fall smaller one in size. Ah, I hope that doesn't uh, affect anyone that the lights went down a bit, but it's most welcome. The other branch I was about to mention is labeled X2 from the British XB for counterintelligence and counterespionage, of which it was sometimes said that their work was so secret that not even those assigned to it were always sure what they were doing. I conclude this observation only in self-defense, because I, my service was X2 throughout my time with the OSS. Unfortunately, I'd hoped that I would be accompanied as well today by my d dear friend and also great hero of OSS, Major General Jack Singlaub. But Owen will do very well as, thank you. I'm not sure about that. Jack was uh, one of the great heroes of OSS and of the U.S. Army, really. In very brief words, he parachuted into France, first of all, and was instrumental in organizing the Maquisar, who impeded the arrival of German armored divisions to threaten the Normandy beachhead. And by their work, they delayed the arrival of those armor divisions until the beachhead was secure. Jack would have been with us today, except yesterday his doctors grounded him and wouldn't let him fly. So he's doing well. He's down in Tennessee, but it, he just couldn't make it today. And he called me to say he was missing the occasion and would love to be here, but his wife had put shackles around both his ankles, <laughs> and he was unable to leave the house. Not only did he do that, but for, encore, for an encore, he f jumped into J uh, occupied China to a prisoner of war camp which held hundreds, literally hundreds, of allied prisoners. And by force of his persuasiveness, he convinced the Japanese commander, who was by far his senior officer, 
uh, Jack adopted a couple of stars for the occasion, uh, that to surrender, and by so doing, he saved the lives of literally hundreds of Allied prisoners of war and took in a few Japanese generals for, to boot. Uh, he, he, I can't begin to repeat how well he does it, but uh, at least uh, he should be recognized uh, on, the, on this occasion. The rest of OSS was not as important. This SO and SI were the major elements, and I stress that because Bill's service was in SI in London, and I'll get to that shortly. There were other elements, obviously, the usual administrative people, morale operations, a maritime unit, something called special projects, which no, nobody ever really figured out what it was doing, uh, but it uh, was a good name. The operational group, the operational group was like SO, except that it involved using Americans of what first generation heritage who spoke the, the local language fluently to jump back into those countries, particularly the Balkans and especially Greece and Albania of all places, and organize large resistance groups in battalion and even regimental size which harassed the Germans uh, throughout the remainder of the war. Enter William Joseph Casey, who following his brother George into the military service was able to gain a commission as a lieutenant junior grade in the U.S. Navy, serving in the Office of Procurement and Materiel in Washington in, July, in June and July of 1943. This restless mind was quickly bored by the pedestrian world of naval procurement, however, and he cast about for a more active role. Fortuitously, a former law partner of his was already serving with OSS headquarters and was able to arrange for Bill to be interviewed by a mysterious Colonel Vanderblue, who has never been further identified, which in turn quickly led to Bill's being hired by Otto During, who was Donovan's right-hand man and law partner. During assigned Bill to a group of young lawyers running Don Donovan's secretariat in Washington as preparation for an assignment to London to organize a similar secretariat for, which, for what was described as a chaotic situation in the front office of the London station chief, Colonel David Bruce. Armed with a handwritten letter from General Donovan, Casey presented himself to Bruce in October of 1943. The latter opened the letter from Donovan and commented, my, what a nice letter. I will certainly want to put this in my personal file right away but I'm sure we'll find something useful for you to do here. Good day. And that was Bill Casey's introduction to the London station. Casey was by no means nonplussed by this airy dismissal and set about looking for a productive way to employ his boundless energies. But first he attended a meeting on OSS finances chaired by a Navy captain, Junius Morgan. As the junior officer present, Bill stood by the door as the others entered until Lieutenant Commander guest appeared, and in the peremptory tone, turned to Casey and said, Lieutenant, get me a chair. Whereupon, Bill responded, get it yourself. <laughs> Quickly followed by an audible gasp, which went around the room. Shortly after the awkward meeting attended, adjourned, Casey was summoned by Captain Morgan to his office. Obviously embarrassed, Morgan began by saying the commander guest was demanding a captain's mass to discipline this unsubordinate officer. Plaintively, it is recorded, Captain Morgan looked at Bill and said, quote, Bill, will you please try to be a bit more cordial the next time you encounter commander guest, and dismissed him. It is this presence of many members of high society and OSS's ranks, by the way, to include Vanderbilts, Morgans, Mellons, and such, that led to the moniker of Oh So Social. That's among the more printable versions of OSS expansion. To Casey, however, they were the white shoe boys, as he loved to, com to label them, for whom he did not display the expected obedience and deference. Bill's search for a useful way to engage his formidable talent in Alexis and in 
relentless curiosity led him to uncover the fact that there was a veritable tsunami of reporting from many sources flowing into the London station, especially from the governments in exile from France, Belgium, Norway, and other places. And at the time, there was no orderly way of recording, processing, and disseminating the material, a task which he jumped into with great relish. One of his colleagues, incidentally, it is recorded, observed that Bill could take vast amounts of paper and reduce them to coherent, eminently readable, and interesting digests. The only problem this wag subsequently observed was that even though 50% of it was pure horse manure, it was so beautifully done that even Bill himself came to believe in it. One of the things Bill also learned shortly after his arrival in London was that not all Englishmen welcomed the rising tide of American officials, even in the intelligence realm. A senior official in MI6, Malcolm Muggeridge, commented, and I quote, ah, those first OSS arrivals in London. How well I remember them, arriving like Jean Fionfleur, straight from finishing school, all fresh and innocent, to start work in our frowsy old intelligence brothel, unquote. And the Russian agent of long standing, Kim Philby, characterized the Americans as, quote, a notably bewildered group, unquote, whose arrival in London was, quote, a pain in the neck, unquote. And one of the other favorite expansions that the British used was to describe the American invasion of their homeland, as it were, was over here, overpaid, and oversexed. <laughs> but the real recognition and exploitation of Bill's talents occurred when Donovan came to see them in action and made Bill his man in London. What that meant in practical terms was that he turned to Bill for much of his information about activities in London, and whenever he came, Bill was constantly at his beck and call. One of Bill's favorite stories about Donovan's visit when he occupied a large suite at Claridge's, was that the last thing at night he would send Bill to Bumpus's bookstore around the corner with instructions to pick up any new books on history, military affairs, and economics. Bill would return with an armload of books and depart for the night. The next morning, as Donovan was preparing himself for his day and Bill was waiting for him, Bill would quickly take a peek at the pile of books and discover to his amazement that they were full of marginalia, indicating that Donovan had gone through them all during the night. It was a habit Bill acquired, by the way, when he was director of the DCI. Every city he visited, the first thing he had his security people identify was the bookstores. And he never failed to come back with a fair portion of that library and also peruse them added lots of marginalia of his own. Both men early on recognized how much they had in common. Insatiable thirst for knowledge, a willingness to consider new and different ideas, and an endless curiosity about all things in minds which seemed never to tire and were impatient with lesser mortals who could not follow the turns and twists of their fertile imaginations. As a consequence, Donovan increasingly took Bill with him on some of his most hazardous trips including a visit to Normandy on D-Day plus two, where both men were appalled by the destruction and wreckage littering the beaches. It will surprise no one that Bill Casey had begun sending his own thoughts and ideas to Donovan regularly by cable, and they exchanged thoughts regularly. So it must have struck a sympathetic chord when he noted in the message dated shortly after the liberation of Paris that it was time to start thinking about and planning for the next major challenge to confront OSS in Europe, the penetration of Germany to provide that kind of tactical and strategic intelligence so necessary to winning the war once the liberation of France was complete. His message struck a chord with Donovan, not surprisingly, who urged him to begin drafting concrete proposals for fulfilling this vital task. It came as no surprise, therefore, that when the incumbent OSS chief of secret intelligence in London departed, the powers that be wasted no time in selecting Bill Casey for this daunting challenge, and it is ironic that until the date of his selection, his official title had remained chief of a non-existent secretariat. 
recognizing that Bill's modest rank would be something of a hindrance to, in his dealings with, he would now be having with very senior Allied officers, David Bruce took him to see Admiral Stark, the U.S. Naval Commander in Europe, in hopes of arranging a few extra stripes to a more suitable rank. The good Admiral politely declined the prospect of offending a wide range of more senior naval officers, but offered an alternative. He took Bill and David Bruce around the, out of the office and around to a clothing store where he produced coupons to purchase two civilian gray suits for Bill Casey, at which time Bill entered a curious twilight zone of, quote, inactive Navy service, unquote, and placed his uniform in mothballs. Bill attacked this new assignment with his usual energy and imagination. He quickly realized that two major problems consulted them. The first was where to find potential agents for infiltration through German lines into the heartland, and second, how to communicate with agents inside Germany once they became established there. Unlike France, Belgium, and other countries, they could hardly wander the streets with a suitcase full of radio equipment. With his usual drive and imagination, he first decided to visit his UK counterparts, the head of MI6 and the head of SOE, both of whom were very negative, discouraging, and said that this simply could not be done, that they had tried and failed. Bill came back to the office delighted. He said, great, that means I won't have to get them out of my way when I do my job. First of all, he found a former RCA employee hidden somewhere in the bowels of the OSS station, and he sat down with him and he said, here's my problem, what do I do about it? And after not too long a time, the RCA man came back to him and said, I've solved your problem for you, Bill. He said, great, what am I going to do? And he said, I've developed something called a Joan Eleanor. And the Joan Eleanor consists of a very small transceiver that will fit in the palm of your hand. That emits a signal which goes vertically to up into the stratosphere, but at ground level it has no dispersion whatsoever. The size of the signal is less than the thickness of a pencil, and it will go directly up, and as it does, it spreads so that if there's an airplane circulating the right time up there in the sky, it can pick up that signal, record it, and have a two-way conversation with the sender on the ground with a small handheld transceiver. That was one solution, and it worked like a charm, was used extensively with agents who did get inside Germany. His second problem, of course, was finding people to get through into Germany successfully. This was unlike the occupied countries of France and Belgium and the Netherlands, where it was a sympathetic reception committee and finding help on the ground was relatively simple. In Germany, there would be no friendly faces whatsoever. In fact, anything but. Putting on his thinking cap, Bill solved this problem on the ground, starting with refugees he identified in London from Germany and Austria. He had a labor branch in, in uh, the London station, which dealt regularly with refugees from that part of the world, and they were able to find some Germans and Austrians prepared to go back in uh, under very deepest of covers. He also sent some of his OSS people in German uniforms into POW cages, and they would rattle around and talk to the prisoners there, and although it's against the articles of war to force prisoners of war to work against their native country, by talking to enough people they found discontented prisoners who were prepared to put back on their German uniforms and go back into Germany and Austria to serve as spies for the OSS. The success of Bill's efforts in this program are reflected by the fact that his efforts were responsible for the dispatch of 150 agents into Germany, including as far as Berlin and Vienna, 95% of whom survived to tell their tales, a remarkable performance. One of his most successful operations was recruiting an Austrian socialist woman known as Crocus 
who was infiltrated back into Vienna through Switzerland and produced and organized an extensive and productive network of Austrian socialists opposed to Hitler. Upon return from her briefing in Switzerland, she unfortunately stumbled across an SS patrol, and although gravely wounded in both eggs, both legs attempted to escape from the patrol, but was so wounded that she could not, at which point she bit into her L tablet and committed suicide. As the war in Europe was nearing its end, Bill was urged to sign on to become chief of SI for all of Germany. He said, I really am not interested in Germany as such, and I have no command of the German language, but I'm prepared to pack up my people and go to the Far East and repeat the performance in J on Japan. When the war in Europe then ended, Bill returned to his wife and daughter in the U.S., which is what he really wanted to do anyway, in expectation, nonetheless, of possible deployment to the Far East. But nuclear weapons were dropped, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and on August 1945, Japan surrendered, the war was over, and Bill immediately submitted his resignation. <coughs> his personnel file contains a long and plaintive letter from David Bruce's successor in London, General Donovan, begging the general to prevail upon Bill to stay on, a letter which in, is indeed a tribute to Bill's hugely successful tour of duty in London. He had also been recognized, by the way, by a, the Bronze Star awarded to him by Admiral Stark. And his file contains a glowing recommendation of several pages in length, so highly classified that it obviously never went anywhere for the Legion of Merit. And that seems to have been lost in the shuffle of demobilization somewhere because it was never acted upon, unfortunately. And true to General Donovan's bleak comment at the time of Roosevelt's death, we have lost the one man who kept the wolves from the door. It took President Truman less than two months to issue an executive order abolishing OSS and scattering the remnants to the four winds, dismissing, dismissing General Donovan with the faintest of praise. The ultimate irony, of course, is that it required less than two years for Truman to recognize the indispensability of a Central Intelligence Agency, which was reconstituted by the National Security Act of 1947. Bill was asked some years later to sum up his view of these frenetic years, and I quote his response. Maybe it was because I was young, but I'd never known such responsibility. I had 500 people under me, a couple of air squadrons at my disposal, a dozen French chateaux where we kept agents, I could walk into Patton's or Bradley's briefings any time I wanted to. I felt part of something larger than myself. I was making decisions.